conference, but uh, as I've been told, apparently childcare malfunction is one of the best excuses for anything, and so this was indeed the case. Um, the other thing is when I was looking for a certain picture, I came across this, and so if you're checking email or doing other things, uh, you're not the only person uh, that doesn't care about gravitational waves. And so uh, what I will do is to give a brief overview, and so since this is not a 45-minute lecture, I'll spend relatively little time on the introduction of gravitational waves and detectors and things like that. Uh, I will definitely try to make sure that there's time for questions, so if you have more questions about these things, please uh, go ahead. And so uh, gravitational waves are a consequence of general relativity. Uh, if you solve this equation in an empty universe, then you don't get nothing. And that's one of the most peculiar things of general relativity, that even an empty universe is not nothing. And so if you perturb that nothing, you get wave solutions. And that essentially is the most short thing I can explain gravitational waves. And so they are depicted like this, uh, that of course you need to disturb uh, space-time and then you need uh, massive objects like black holes. But then if you have created that perturbation, it goes as a wave through the universe. And so there's this very nice animation of how that looks like. It's propagating, it's a transverse wave. So uh, perpendicular to the, the, the direction of the wave, it's changing the metric, so essentially the distances in uh, uh, space. Um, there's a few other nice properties, as two polarization, so you can learn even more about the sources. Um, they hardly interact, so they go through everything, uh, and you can see right up to the most dense uh, parts uh, in, uh, in the universe. Uh, the catch is, of course, that they're extremely weak. And so uh, the technical term of how you generate these is that you have to have a varying quadrupole moment uh, in the mass or energy distribution, and that then generates the waves. And of course, you need strong gravity in order to get anything done. And so, uh, especially relevant for this conference, a binary system has a very nice quadrupole moment, and it's also changing. And so binary systems are very good sources of gravitational waves. And so the measurement principle in principle is simple. If I take my two hands and a gravitational wave passes, my hands get large, the distance between my hands gets larger and smaller periodically. Uh, of course, the first thing you would want to do is take a ruler. It doesn't work because the ruler gets bigger and smaller too but we're saved by light. Light has constant speed, and so actually the time of a light ray between my two hands becomes longer and shorter. And so if I give lectures, I go on and say, if you have a perfect clock, you could actually measure gravitational waves in that way. Uh, but for here, the point is that the solution to this problem is that you measure the time that the light wave uh, travels between my two arms by comparing it to a light wave that's going in the uh, per, uh, perpendicular direction, because when the gravitational wave passes at the time that one arm is stretched, the other is compressed, and half a phase later, it's the opposite. And so in that way, you can measure gravitational waves. However, there are two problems. The first is that the signal is tiny. And so when I gave a colloquium once, because I wanted a job, there was a, a laser physicist in the audience who was scribbling on a piece of paper, and then raised his hand and said, you know, the thing you want to measure is 10 to the minus 10 of the wavelength. I'm a laser physicist, I can tell you this is impossible. <laughs> and so this is something that really needs a lot of work. The other thing is, just recently I heard that uh, for space-based gravitational wave detectors, we're measuring picometer distances in space, and when this was mentioned to a space engineer, he started laughing out loud and said, you know, that's ridiculous. And so this is really quite difficult to do and therefore it took some time before it was done. The other thing is noise. And so the typical lengths you want to measure is 10 to the minus 20 or 21 of the arm length. And so if you have kilometer length arms, this is still in the, I think, atometer or whatever, 10 to the minus 18 uh, meter range. And of course, on Earth, there are lots of things that are moving and vibrating 
with amplitudes that are way, way bigger than that. So how is it solved? Uh, so, uh, and so I actually realized when I was typing up, this is uh, it's even much smaller than femtometers. Uh, on Earth, you build a detector which is vacuum, uh, which is uh, aligned very accurately, etc. all kind of tricks to get to this accuracy of 10 to the minus 10 of the wavelength. And then you isolate the whole thing from the environment as much as possible uh, of the order of 10 orders of magnitude reduction in the, uh, the, the disturbances. And so the famous stories are that logging in Canada disturbs the detectors in the United States. The waves in the shore, uh, at the shore of uh, northern Germany can actually be measured by the detector in Hanover. And all these kind of things show how much you need to work to get rid of the noise. So what's the status? There's, of course, advanced LIGO and advanced Virgo. Advanced LIGO is running. You may have heard some stories from that detector. I'll mention them later. Advanced Virgo in Italy is in commissioning and hopefully will join the science run in the next few months. There are future plans to essentially go underground where the noise of the surface is a lot less. And so there are plans in Europe, the Einstein telescope, and in the United States, Cosmic Explorer, and there we're talking about, you know, sort of end of the 2020s earliest. Gravitational waves have a wavelength and a frequency. And so they come in different wavelengths. And so if you want to measure different wavelengths, you need different detectors. Uh, the rule of thumb for gravitational waves is wavelength equals source size and wavelength equals detector size. And so if you want to measure something which is a million kilometers, which is quite small for astronomical uh, standards, you need to build a million kilometer size detector. And so this doesn't fit on Earth. And so there are plans to launch a satellite in hopefully 2034. This has been selected by ESA, which is a technical term for the second step in a, a three-step process for being finally realized. Um, uh, which will have arms of two and a half million kilometers, and so can go to very large <coughs> wavelengths or long, low frequencies. At the very extreme, people have thought of a very clever way, and that's using pulsars as a gravitational wave detector. And so essentially you take the distance between the radio pulsar and the Earth as the effective arm, and so you take, again, the light travel time, which you measure by the very accurate clock of the radio pulsar, as your very long wavelength detector. However, for binary stars, this is not so relevant. And so what you see here, it's a quite a busy plot, but I just want to show that over <coughs> essentially 13 orders of magnitude in frequency, there are different detectors uh, operational or planned, and they all have associated sources. The rest of the talk, I will mainly talk about the uh, detectors on the right-hand side. There is something very peculiar about gravitational waves. If you calculate the energy loss of a rod that's rotating and that's generating gravitational wave, you see that the prefactor is g over c to the fifth. That's an extremely small number. And that's why gravitational waves are so weak. However, I won't go to the details. You can do it yourself if you want or look it up on the web. If you fill in Kepler's law, then you can do this rewrite, and I didn't make a mistake, but all of a sudden now there's c to the fifth over g, which obviously is an extremely large number. And of course, to compensate that, I have here, you know, g over c squared to the fifth, and so it works. And so this is normally an extremely, extremely small number. g m over l divided by c squared is typically extremely small, except, of course, if you are close to something like a black hole, where this term all of a sudden gets in the order of one. And so that's the magic of gravitational waves. Normally, you talk about something like 10 to the minus 54 watts. However, if we talk about black holes, all of a sudden you can go to the complete other side of the spectrum and the most energetic thing ever. The other thing that will be important is that, of course, the frequency of the gravitational wave, this thing here, essentially, scales with m over l cubed. And so for black holes, that means that there is a particular frequency that fits with the mass of the black hole. 
And so massive black holes essentially emit or merge at lower frequencies. And so that's why one of the reasons we need different uh, detectors. So now, this was all the basics. What can we get out of this? So how far can we see? And so these are very nice type of plots. They're called horizon. And so this is essentially the distance to which a certain detector can detect a gravitational wave merger uh, that's optimally oriented in inclination and with respect to the detector. So it's sort of a best case scenario. And what you see here is that uh, this is from a astrophysical interpretation paper that came out last year with the first detection. The thing is that if you look at just the blue line, the sensitivity of the detectors in sort of 2019 is such that as a function of the total mass, and for our simplicity, we assume that the two objects have the same mass, but it doesn't really matter a lot. You can see two, something like one to 10 gigaparsecs, or if you're more familiar with this scale, this is the redshift, sort of redshifts of 0.2 to 0.5, or uh, to two. Of course, these are extremely massive objects, so you would need very massive black holes. How does that scale in the future? <clears throat> and sorry for the busy plot, just look at the green line, which is the line for the Einstein telescope. You see here that for masses sort of around 10 and higher, you could see up to redshifts of 10. And so these gravitational wave detectors, the next generation can essentially see in one goal almost the whole universe. The same holds for the LISA detector. So LISA is sensitive at much lower frequencies, so higher masses. And so if you plot this in the same diagram, you see here for ET and then LISA ramping up. And you see there's this very nice region of overlap. But again, for LISA, you see that, especially for very massive objects, and this is even more true for supermassive black holes, which is not the topic here, you can essentially see the whole universe in one go. And so that means this is nice for binary stars. Um, as I'm sure has been shown a few times already, uh, of course, we do not really know everything there is to know about compact objects and binaries. And so there's many, many different questions. Some of these, actually, you can get some additional information from gravitational waves. And we'd like to give an overview in the next 10 minutes or so of uh, what that looks like, essentially moving from binary black holes to neutron stars to white dwarfs. Um, just the first uh, a small sidestep uh, to show uh, that, of course, uh, it's not only gravitational waves uh, that give information. This is a uh, promotion of some work of one of my students who looked at black hole kicks, which is something quite important for uh, the formation of binary black holes. And people believed for a long time that if you form a black hole by fallback from uh, in, a neutron, in a supernova where you first form a neutron star, you would actually reduce the kick compared to the neutron star case by essentially a factor of 10 or so. However, we see many black hole X-ray binaries at quite high above the galactic plane. And so they must have gotten there in some way. And so the easiest solution is that they receive a kick when they were formed. And so this is a plot where essentially we compare in a cumulative way the height above the plane that you expect for systems for different galactic radii, because it's not the same in this galactic center as outside. So you need to renormalize. But so you expect, this is the expected fraction, and that's the observed fraction above that line. And you see that uh, model in which the kick is quite high fits better. And so whether or not that means that all black holes get large kicks, that's of course unclear. Okay, I hope you've all seen this plot. <laughs> um, and so this is the plot of the first detection of gravitational waves, uh, where you clearly see the signal in the data. And so we were lucky in a way, because this is a quite nice PR plot, but we've also unfortunately in this way put everybody on the wrong footing because the way gravitational waves are detected is by match filtering of pre-calculated known data to the observed data. 
And so normally you would expect that the signal to noise ratio is sort of distributed over a long period of time. And you would see something like this, where if the black line wasn't there, um, I guess hardly anybody, I certainly, would have seen that there is a gravitational wave signal in there. And so this is the normal way that we detect gravitational waves. This is a five sigma detection. And so this is extremely uh, reliable detection of gravitational waves. So just be prepared that this we will not see very often. We will normally see this. All right, so let's get going. We now have gravitational wave data. What did we measure? From the gravitational waves, you get an in indication on the masses, the, this combination of masses that's called the chirp mass, which essentially, if you plot it in M1 versus M2, has these sort of banana shapes. Um, some information on the rates and the effect, effective spin, but I'll get to that in a minute. This is a very nice overview of the measured masses of the 2.8 detections, the, the 3.8 detections that we have so far. And so if you want to know how you can have a 0.8 detection, ask me later. Uh, this is the 0.8 and these are the, the three ones. Um, you see that they span quite a large range of masses. And so the, of course the first one is really high mass. And the second one was quite low mass or more, some people would say more normal mass and the others are sort of in between. And so this immediately gives the, uh, the hint that we're going towards measuring sort of a mass spectrum, but we need more data. The other thing that you can measure is what's called the effective spin. And so if you have two black holes that are spinning and you project the spins of the black holes to the spin, essentially the, the normal on the uh, orbital plane, and you weigh that by the mass, so m1 times the spin of one times the angle plus m2, et cetera, divided by the total mass. So this is something between minus one and plus one. So minus one is maximal spin down, plus one is maximum spin up, and everything in between is either smaller spin or larger angles. And so this is something that also can be measured. And uh, the rate, which is not terribly well determined, but of course this will improve in, uh, in the future. And so from these three masses, you can do a mass spectrum, which obviously, are the, are the, the 3.8, obviously this is not very well constrained. And so one thing to realize is we do actually know quite a bit, because a, a system like GW 150914, you can see about, uh, what is it, uh, eight or so times further than the lower mass black holes. And so the fact that we actually observe lower mass black holes immediately means that they are probably more common per volume, right? And so the, the, this curve is probably going down. Uh, of course, with three, you can still not actually really prove that, but this is something that quite rapidly will uh, start to uh, uh, get better. The other thing which is very interesting is that this is the measurement of this effective spin parameter. And the most recent detection, 170104, caused a bit of a stir, at least among some people, because you can see that it's quite likely that this effective spin is negative. And so that means that the spins of the black holes certainly cannot have been aligned if it's negative. Of course, there's still some probability that it's positive and so. This is something that clearly will put information on uh, uh, the uh, astrophysics. So uh, how do we actually get these? Um, there are a couple of uh, ways, and so I'll first uh, show uh, examples of what we call sort of uh, isolated binary, so normal binary evolution, um, based essentially on the ideas that were around for the formation of double neutron stars. Here's a nice plot from a recent, very extensive paper by Thomas Tauris, which is on the archive. Uh, I recommend you to read this about double neutron stars. But if you just take more massive stars, you can have two black holes here at the end. Um, then there is the work that uh, Selma started sort of in the, uh, uh, I was gonna say 10 years ago, eight years ago, um, about 
very rapidly rotating stars that could evolve in a very different way and essentially do not expand. And so you could keep them in a tight binary and in that way form binary black holes. Um, and then there is uh, the very recent paper by Ed and Simon and uh, Selma realizing that in this stage here, if you have a black hole, that actually the mass ratio is such that you maybe you can just avoid this whole common envelope in the first place and you can start with much shorter uh, orbital periods, which actually links very nicely with observed wolf rear binaries. Then, of course, there's the other way to form them in clusters or in dense environments, uh, and I won't say too much about that here. I just want to list that this may not be the only way in which you can form uh, binary black holes. So how do we distinguish between uh, these different scenarios? Well, obviously more data, um, but there's a few things. Uh, of course, the masses of GW 150914 were already very high, and so maybe pointing to low metallicity, so there's a uh, few um, uh, little mass loss. Um, unfortunately, these different ways in which the binaries were, uh, can be formed are not very certain, so it's not that we can just predict what the mass spectrum is of all these different formation channels and then match that to the data and decide which of the channels is best because the mass distributions are quite uncertain. However, uh, of course, it could be that we find something very interesting in the data, bimodal distribution, for instance, or things like that. Um, and then there's this question about the spins. And so, naively, you would think, ah, if this effective spin is negative, surely it doesn't come from an isolated binary, because if you form the two black holes in a dynamical environment, the spins are expected to be random. So that's much more natural. However, of course, you have to be careful because we know a double neutron star that has no evidence at all of being formed dynamically where there is a very large misalignment between the spins. So maybe this is not really the, the uh, thing to go about. Very quickly about uh, the plot I showed earlier, uh, Alberto Cesana realized very early on that the masses of GW150914 are so high that actually with LISA you could see these up to a few hundred parsecs. And so there's now this class of very massive binary black holes that can evolve from the LISA band into the LIGO or more likely ET band by the time and be observed essentially at two different frequencies a couple of years apart. And that would of course be great. Um, in principle, if we get more numbers, we really can learn a lot. Uh, these are, of course, my hand-waving expectations. We'll have to see how it pans out if we really get to tens or hundreds or thousands of detections. But certainly with a detector like Einstein telescope where you can see up to redshifts of 10, thousands of detections is really not something that would be crazy. And so I think essentially the way is that more and more you could bin up the parameters and just measure the distributions and the rates and the uh, different parameters. I want to spend the last few minutes on neutron stars and white dwarfs. And so what's different with neutron stars is that if you merge neutron stars, you typically form a black hole, but some of the material remains outside due to angular momentum, essentially, and is low-density neutron star material that will decay and essentially produce energy and emit. And so this so-called kilonova or micronova or different names for the thing uh, is something that could accompany a gravitational wave detection. And so uh, let me skip this and say, uh, let's look for electromagnetic counterparts. And so the first question is why? And the first answer is why not? If you can do it, you should do it because, you know, we really don't know. But actually there's uh, quite good reasons. If you get an electromagnetic counterpart, you measure quite different properties then you measure from the gravitational waves. You can find maybe the exact position, you can pinpoint the stellar population around it, you can maybe measure something about the merger and the ejecta velocities, uh, 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 chemical composition, etc. And you can maybe relate it to the age distribution and therefore much more accurately link it to binary evolution. So let me say a few things about how that works, so we're already doing the uh, follow-up. Essentially, very each second 
the data is monitored. If there's something that seems like an outlier, an alert can be issued. Follow-ups, telescopes these days can uh, uh, point quite accurately and quickly, thanks to gamma ray burst work in the uh, 90s. And the, in that way, you can hope to find gravitational wave counterparts. Uh, the catch is a little bit that we're not quite sure what these kilonova look like, because the, the key thing there is what's the opacity of that material. So you dump a lot of energy, and the question is, and the, the thing is expanding, when does the radiation get out? Early, when it's still small and hot and blue, or late, when it's red and uh, uh, less hot? And so I just want to show why it's so important to have Virgo online. These are the arrow boxes with the LIGO detectors, and if I switch to this one, you see how it would have been with Virgo, and especially here, if you look at the GW150914, really would help to have a third detector. And so, in Nijmegen, we're building a dedicated array of telescopes, black gem, to essentially go after these uh, Kilo Novi. Uh, currently, the prototype is uh, shipped to uh, South Africa to test, and it should be operational by the end of next year. And so this is the prototype, but I don't have time because I want to say something about, uh, whoops, sorry, about white dwarfs. And so white dwarfs are bigger than neutron stars, and therefore they are at the uh, wider separations, have longer wavelengths, and you need to go to LISA. Um, the idea is that, about, uh, th that there are thousands of these objects in the galaxy that can be individually detected. Um, and there's also maybe a foreground of the remaining millions uh, that we cannot see individually. And, uh, oops, sorry. The nice thing is that we actually know a number of binary systems from electromagnetic observations, double white dwarfs and so-called AMCVN stars interacting double white dwarfs that are guaranteed sources for LISA. And so we can, in principle, expect that uh, many of these, more of these will be found in uh, the future, in the years between now and uh, the launch of LISA, for instance, with Gaia and LSST. And so this is a, a simulation uh, that essentially asks the question which uh, binaries will be found by Gaia and LSST that can be LISA sources. And so I have to skip a few things. Um, and uh, jump to the conclusions. And so these are that uh, gravitational waves uh, really are now there. Uh, they cover a very broad spectrum in, uh, in wavelengths and frequencies, and therefore different types of sources. Um, it's not yet true, and maybe it will never be true, that gravitational waves solve all the problems in binary and stellar evolution, but certainly, especially because it's so focused on objects that are quite difficult to study in uh, electromagnetic radiation, uh, I think there's quite a, a lot to come. Thank you.